Hey BookTube, it's Pete. It occurs to me I should start doing uh, some kind of weekly wrap-up because when I was making the last video that I posted, which was uh, ostensibly about uh, the mystery of Marie Roger, the short story by Edgar Allan Poe, I ended up talking about five other things at the same time. So all that, uh, all that priceless content gets lost under what's ostensibly a single work review. Then I thought, well, I'll start it next week because I hardly read anything this, this week, but I did actually read and, and watch a few things. I'll include watches this week. Uh, in fact, I'll start with those because I'm thinking it now. Thank you, uh, Faceless Book Reviews. If you told me your real name at any time, I apologize, or if you've ever used it online, I don't know it, and I can't find it in any of your notes. I know we're buddies. I think of you as a buddy, and I think you think of me as a buddy. Uh, but I'm just going to call you Faceless, since that's the only public name I think you have, which which is fine. You have a great channel. And in one of the comments you made to me last week, you mentioned an app for Westerns, Western Classic Movies app, which I downloaded on my Android device. I can actually have a visual here. Western Classic Movies. I was going to load something. I'll see what I'm watching. I hope it's not something embarrassing. But westerns are never embarrassing. Uh, oh, it's not going to load. Oh, this is this is kind of interesting. It says you can subscribe for six bucks a month, or watch for free, watch for free with ads, or subscribe for five ninety nine a month. However, I assume that meant if you didn't subscribe, and I haven't subscribed that the shows, that the content would have ads in it. It doesn't. I watched a full episode of The Rifleman, and there's no ads in it. There's just ads around the frame. I guess you have to skip past that every time. It's just ads around the frame. Like here, you see there's a... Let's see. Let's say I was going to watch this Lone Ranger here. Maybe Michael K. Vaughn will see this and he'll get excited that I'm helping out with the Low Ranger. Uh, and it's this, you know, another another note about, about, hey, subscribe, subscribe. Six bucks a month is a lot, I think, for this. Um, that was not nice of me to say. Oh, 310 to Yuma, this is a great movie. This is a classic. I even saw this in school. It's a classic Western. Uh, I haven't watched it in a long time. Okay. So, see what I'm doing here in my Everything I Read This Week video, which is now about me showing you how to use an app like you don't know. Uh, anyway, it's it's loading there. I might have to take off the, uh, the VPN or something. I have a lot of troubles with VPN here. Watch now. Uh, I want to show you how the ads look. It just shows ads around the end. It doesn't inter interrupt the, the, the movie. It just shows... Anyway, so on that I watched uh, The Rifleman, which is a show I loved as a kid, and I watched episode 15 of season 1. I'm going to watch the whole series. I used to watch it on another platform that I that doesn't load very well over here. And it's a great show about a rancher who uses a rifle instead of a pistol. Because it's nonviolent, and in these old Western shows from the '60s, these half-hour Western, black and white Western shows, the the gunslinger always had a different kind of gimmick, different kind of gun or something. And, and anyway, it's about him. He's a uh, Chuck Connors plays a rancher. He's raising his son alone and teaching him moral lessons and stuff. But it's a great a great series. Uh, my other watching thing was actually uh, two listening things. Let me see if I can get to this. I follow a couple people on Patreon. I follow book time uh, of of YouTubers. The only YouTuber I follow is Book Time with Elvis. He reads a story on his Patreon every week, a story or a letter or some other piece of literature. This. I, I guess he won't mind me showing this, this just the splat screen of his Patreon. But this is what he read Saturday. It was Pliny's letter to, to Tacitus. 
about Pliny the Younger's letter to Tacitus about the um, the disaster in Pompeii in AD seventy nine. Um, so that's a, a great advantage. I I frankly, and none of these other people are watching because they're they're people who are not on YouTube, but. Frankly, uh, Book Time with Elvis is putting all the other Patreons I follow to shame because he puts out a lot of content on Patreon, a lot of exclusive content. Uh, everybody else I know is kind of there's people I'm paying for that you know barely post one time a month, and sometimes they skip months. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring the hammer down and cancel some of these Patreons. I, I don't belong to that many, but anyway. So that's a little plug for Elvis's Patreon, or I mean for Mark's Patreon. Before I get to actually things I've read, uh, there is podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I try to listen to Spanish podcasts as much as I can. I can never understand them. They talk too fast, but I do it for the rhythm of the language, and I use other kinds of content to um, to study more seriously. I just play them in the background. But there is a great one I found. Uh, the Creepy Podcast, you might have heard of creepy.org. I think it's related to Creepypasta some way. Why can't I find my podcast app? Uh, they have uh, English language pod podcasts, very, very well known. I found that they also have a Spanish one. Creepy in Espanol. No tiene cara. The no face. A pobre de mí is a is a translation of a story originally done on the what was that podcast name it's a story by John Grills the original name is Poor Little Babysitter uh, uh, Pobre Me or what are they calling it here Pobre de Me is a very creepy story I think you could even understand it if you don't have very much Spanish at all uh, the ones it's just it's a great story about this girl who's a, a young woman, um, or girl, I'm not really sure because, again, my Spanish is not that great. So it might have been a young woman or it might have been a teenager. Um, oh, here it says a woman. A woman accepts a work uh, to help a, a small girl who has a, a strange aspect or, a strange, or acts in a strange way. Uh, but it's a very creepy story. Um, so I'm going to hunt down, uh, oh, it's, it was originally from uh, the No Sleep podcast, the, the, the English language version of it, and so I'm going to hunt that down, it's like from season three of that podcast or something, they're already up to season 20, so I didn't have time to really look for it this weekend, but if you like scary stories, creepy the Creepy podcast, they're usually like 20 minute stories or so, uh, very popular, been going a long time. In English, and it looks like this is looks like it's been running a year or so in at least a couple of years in Spanish translations. I believe they're all Spanish translations of stories that originally were in English on one of their other podcasts. Now, the other thing, I I was listening to these for a, a long time ago, and I I forgot why I stopped because they're great, and it's Gunsmoke, uh, Gunsmoke. There's at least five different podcasts. Uh, let me see if you can see that. Or see Philip Marlowe. There's at least five different podcasts that people put out over the years that where they just put up all the 480 episodes of the original radio series Gunsmoke, which ran, started before the TV show, and ran... Uh, concurrently with it for a lot of years with a completely different cast. Uh, I'm going to read part of this description here. In the late 1940s, CBS chairman William S. Paley, a fan of the Philip Marlowe radio series, asked programming chief Hubel Robinson to develop a hard-boiled Western series, a show about a Philip Marlowe in the Old West. So that's the origin of Gunsmoke. And it was done in a different way than a lot of the series of that time were because a lot of the series, they were family oriented series Lone Ranger kind of things and just this was meant to do this is the equivalent of like The Sopranos for the for the late 40s uh, it was supposed to be better written uh, more adult themes I mean it doesn't really 
translate so well today because we're so used to more uh, serious content in every genre. But when you think about it, the theme, the theme of the show is about the West, and William Con Conrad plays Marshall Dillon. The West was just opening up. This is, when did it start? 48? I'm messing this up. Oh, this one doesn't have the dates on it. The other one I used to listen to, I think it was 1948, though. Oh, no, because I'm looking at it the wrong way. Duh. Okay, it was um, 50s, 50, I got to go all the way to the bottom. They did like 40, 50 episodes a season, you know, because they could do them every week. They didn't have to build new sets or anything. They just had to pump them out, you know, the actors didn't have to get into costume they just they didn't have to uh, rehearse that much because they didn't have to memorize everything they could just hold a script 52 so seven years after world war ii ended the sort of premises of the show is people are uh, the west is very violent people are trying to bring order to the west so it's really a show about these men these people coming out of this very violent era, the end of World War II, and trying to normalize their lives. That is the theme of Gunsmoke, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm not an expert, but I, you know, I've listened to the first 18 or so. Actually, there's there's some gaps in the early ones. There's a few of them that were never preserved because I guess they read them live on TV or whatever. I mean, they read them read them live on perform them live over the air for broadcast on radio. They're half hour long. If you, if you really want to go look for them, check for the ones, and like I say, if you, tump, if you type in Gunsmoke Radio, you're going to find like five different podcasters who, who have put these up in the past. Look for the ones that are under 30 minutes. Look for the ones that where the time of each um, episode is like 29 minutes, 30 seconds, things like that, or... 26 minutes. The ones that are like 32 minutes have commercials in them, and I mean new commercials like crappy, you know, get a therapist online kind of crappy uh, podcast commercials that you hear on every other show. The ones that are 29 minutes are just the original broadcast without any new commercials in them. The show, because of its, uh, because of the things I mentioned before, was did not run with sponsors like most of the shows you know if you've ever heard any old time radio shows or seen really old TV shows rotoscopes of shows it's always some sponsor like uh, some coffee or tires or something that they, they talk about and they sometimes even try and work into the plot this didn't have that this has a little break in, the, in between the two acts there's a two act stories 15 minutes a short break which has got some kind of anodyne message from CBS, like, you know, about the support your po local postal workers or something, you know, it's just stuff like that, or like, you know, uh, work hard and you'll be successful, or just different sort of pro sort of, you know, anti-Red Scare or pro-American kind of, we're building a great nation here, kind of, kind of, kind of statements that are, not really meant to do anything except maybe you know help CBS with their licenses because originally radio stations and television stations were supposed to operate as ridiculous as it sounds now they're supposed to they were allowed to have those licenses those monopolies on uh, the public airwaves if they promised to do uh, culturally significant or uplifting or or valuable content and not just put crap on all the time like they do now so that was maybe sort of a loss leader for them or I think it's just really the same they did the same thing with the Philip Marlowe series where there was no commercials they didn't ha want to have to worry about CBS didn't want to have to worry about censoring them for sponsors and that kind of thing they uh, just wanted to do the best writing they could for an adult audience and then kind of attract people to the medium. And uh, it was kind of a prestige thing, which is why I compare it to like 
the Sopranos or whenever whenever a new kind of uh, uh, pay channel like AMC did with Mad Men and other channels have done they'll, they'll put on like a really high quality show and you know until they gain an audience and then they'll you know destroy that audience by just making a bunch of crap shows to follow up with it and that's uh, everything except what I read I in my I read the mystery of Marie Roger the, the Poe story I read a bunch of collections of comics by Wallace Wood. I read his his newspaper strip Canon, which was an adult only uh, adult focused uh, comic strip that ran for military personnel. I read his um, EC collection, Spawn of Mars, and Came the Dawn. Those are those are full of short stories or sci-fi or horror stories. The sci-fi stories are basically horror stories too with like twist endings and eight-page stories, tons of them. Uh, an experimental uh, magazine he ran for a while called Wit's End. I read The Best of Wit's End. I read his Western series Shattuck, which is pretty short. Uh, all those were really enjoyable. I am still reading the Valentine Mystery Series by Lauren D. Estelman. Everybody cares so much about that. I just, you know, my, my, my inbox is blowing up with all the comments and all the interest that, that these books have generated on my channel. But anyway, just regardless, I like them. Uh, I don't know why they're not more popular, but I'm reading the, I finished the fourth one, which is called Shoot, which is about Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. I think I dis discussed that one before. Alive, the third one, uh, was about Bela Lugosi's screen test for as the monster in the original Frankenstein movie. I know I discussed that one. The one I'm reading now is called Brazen, in which Valentine, throughout this whole series, Valentine, he's a film restorer for UCLA. That's his main job. He has a card printed up that says film detective, where he's supposed to be looking. His ostensible job is to find, recover prints of lost movies, like the eight-hour version of Greed, or the, and yet he always seems to, uh, you know, stumble across a murder or a gangster or blackmailing or something like that. And now in Brazen, that's acknowledged, which I thought is very funny. Uh, he has a good friend in in this one Brazen that I'm reading. He has a good friend, an older actress, who feels like she's got a curse on her because. She calls it the blonde curse because she stopped getting work at a certain age because she was like a quote unquote blonde bombshell type. And she, uh, this is pretty early on, so it's not a spoiler. She gets murdered, sadly, and she's a good friend of his. And so he's involved in the investigation. I haven't got, I'm only in about chapter six, so I don't know. There's some kind of creepy serial killer thing going on because it, the person who murdered her tried to pose her like that, like like Marilyn Monroe was supposedly posed on, on her death. So something much more sickening uh, going on than just a random murder. Uh, Valentine runs into a cop who he's met before in one of his cases, and the cop proceeds to, to break down the absurdity, which I've never seen in any one of these books, which every really series should really have. You know, like how many murders do these people? You know, it's that old joke about Jessica Fletcher, Fletcher for a murder she wrote the series. It's like she must be a serial killer. Everywhere she goes, there's a murder immediately. You know, every time she goes to a, to a book signing event, somebody gets murdered. And it's kind of getting to be the same thing with this guy Valentine. He's supposed to be just looking for for uh, stuff that's not that high of stakes, you know, lost film prints and stuff, and he's always stumbling across murders and gang wars and stuff, and this cop kind of says, hey, didn't, weren't, last year, didn't, wasn't your other friend murdered, and the year before that wasn't, uh, wasn't, you, weren't you involved in that blackmail plot, and it's very funny that, that that's going on, so he's got kind of an advers uh, adversarial uh, situation there the our hero Valentine has Valentino I keep calling him Valentine has with with a police officer so I enjoyed that he uh, in the other books I've talked about I haven't mentioned yet that this, this whole time he's been re renovating a theater 
a revival theater, which would be a great dream. I like reading about that stuff. That's what I would do if I were a billionaire. I would, I would get, um, I'd find some city, some medium-sized city or something, and I would put a revival theater there. And next to it, I would put a bookstore, and I would pay, I would overpay the employees so much just so I could have the best people working there. That's what I would do if I wanted to buy myself a job, but I don't, and I probably, uh, probably not something I have to worry about anytime soon. Uh, you never know, this channel could blow up, and I'll have millions to worry about. Okay, so I read, so I'm reading that. Dude, this is one of my quick videos, only 20 minutes. Hey. This is the last thing I'm going to discuss. I'm going to bring it up on my reader apps just so I can show you the cover. This book, this, like like I was saying before, originally when I started the 100 book challenge, I was also going to include books that were on my library hold list that hadn't come in yet. There's another section of my library hold list. I didn't realize that it really worked. It's if You can look up a book, and if they don't have it, you can tag it. This is in the, the uh, whatever you call that, the Libby app. And if they get it, you'll, you'll go on the hold list. So they did not have these books by Howard Andrew Jones. Not, neither of the libraries that I'm a member of in, in King County. There's King County, King County Library and the Seattle Public Library, both uh, which I'm eligible for because I'm still a resident of Washington technically. Nobody had these books, which are uh, which I've heard a lot of great things about, and then they showed up, so I got them. I'm very excited about that. The, they are called. The first one's called "The Lord of the Shattered Land," and its sequel. Uh, they're by Howard Andrew Jones. I believe they're published by Bain Books. Um, I'm vamping here, so I can bring up the. Oh my lord. bring up one of the covers. Okay, I can't keep this going forever. Here, so here's the cover of the second one. The first one's called Lord of the Shattered, Shattered Lands. The, the sequel is called The City of Marble and Blood. It's not going to let me show these. Oh my lord. Okay, so I haven't started this one yet. This is this Chronicles of Hanover 2, and these books... I've only read the first two stories of the first book. And I know that they're trying to market these as novels. They're, they're workups. They're separate stories, continuous stories put into a novel length. But short stories are, or long stories, around 10,000 words or so, are the backbone of the sword and sorcery genre. So I, I am not making any... Um, bones about that neither, neither of these books these the best the best short sword and sorcery is short Robert Howard Fritz Leiber uh, in more recent uh, James Ang Ang or Ang I'm not sure how you say it I really should know uh, writes an excellent series today um, Nifthaline by Michael Shea short stories uh, one or two novels in there too um, uh, who else? Gianna Russ's character, Alex, A L Y X. I like those a lot. Some of those are short stories, and then, then I mean, some of those are um, sword and sorcery, and then they move into uh, science fiction because the character Alex gets taken to the future, which is cool. I recommend all those series. But this Howard, these Howard and Andrew Jones books, I, the character I think is based a bit, this Hanover character is based a bit on. Hannibal, if I got that right, the right general. The premise is fantastic. Uh, the stories are being narrated by a, a scribe down the years. Uh, this this character Hanover uh, is a, a king who's defeated and enslaved, and this is just early on and. And break and breaks away and and meets new alloys and he's meets new allies and he's uh, 
trying to get back to reclaim his kingdom and to rescue his daughter who his daughter is also a, a warrior so he's an older older hero um, so good so good I wish I almost stayed up later I talk about in my video which is coming up next about uh, the importance of sleep but I, don't, I really wanted to stay up late and keep reading this last night but I didn't so I only read the first two chapters and that's everything I've been reading this week uh, under half an hour. I was really thought I was going to get this done in 10 minutes. So I'm going to stop talking now.